Hailing from the Jersey Shore and raised as athletes, the Airy Bros have always shared a passion for physical culture, athletic performance, and human optimization. Always striving to be the strongest versions of themselves, mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. Along the way, they've met some pretty amazing humans and have had some pretty epic adventures. The intention of Airy Bros Radio is to showcase these amazing people and the impact that they've had on them and to share tips, tricks, and hacks so that you can win each day, every day. You're listening to Airy Bros Radio. Be there or be square, because it's all killer, no filler. I lived 32 years before completely activated. It took about one year to activate, and then there's been 50 years since then. And then I felt my solar plexus opening and a force field of energy shooting out in through out of outside of my body and into my third eye. Great writers, great artists are Kundalini ready at birth. After Kundalini started, I didn't do it. It did and it does me. It is an evolutionary energy. It is the uh, Gopi Krishna spoke of something he called the evolutionary impulse. And that is an impulse in mankind to evolve. You, It's very beneficial to remember yourself because self-control is the secret to life on Earth. Kundalini is a biological process to begin with, not some kind of spiritual thing. You, you go from the profane to the sacred, if, if you would. This is JJ Semple, and you're listening to Airy Brothers Radio. So we wanted to uh, to get you on to uh, educate our audience on the powers of Kundalini, the backward forward method, uh, the golden flower, and all your works. Maybe kind of give us a uh, beginner's guide to Kundalini. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yesterday I ran across an article in a, I guess, a traditional publishing magazine that was purported to do that for the average person, uh, run down Kundalini, and boy, I mean, was it misleading and misguiding. And it's, it's very, the, the problem is, is there's so many different, every Kundalini experience is different. And they go from uh, an experience that is more or less planned and um, through a, a practice, the result of a practice like meditation or some type of yoga. And those uh, experiences are more or less under control. I mean, obviously that can get out of control depending on the person's anatomy. Kundalini is a biological process to begin with, not some kind of spiritual thing. You, you go from the profane to the sacred, if, if you would. And um, the other end is, of the spectrum is experiences that just come on to people walking down the street or riding the subway or whatever they happen to be doing. And those types of experiences, the people can run into trouble and often do. I get phone calls and emails uh, all the time from people that are having problems. And the problem is that um, not much I can do for them because my experience was totally different. And I don't want to leap out and, and say, oh, sure, you can comfort people, but you can't get inside them to see what's going on. And once this biological process starts it's known in in uh in the kundalini lexicon as uh sexual sublimation in other words a semen and a cervical fluid and seminal fluid in the human body the man and woman uh the semen or the cervical fluid is distilled into a kind of an elixir that can pass from the lower quadrant, the, the um, 
coccyx and the uh, lower belly up the spine into the brain. Obviously, the semen itself could not do that because it's a liquid. So some portion of this is in an esoteric, uh, more or less magical way is distilled. And once it gets to the brain, it starts to inventory, number one, the whole body in terms of physical deformations or physical issues. And if it can, it sends life force energy to those portions of the body or parts of the body to correct those imperfections. Um, it also starts working on the brain, in other words, on the creativity aspect of the brain, left and right brain balancing. Uh, and these, these things are uh, uh, very gradual. It takes years, more or less. Now, Gopi Krishna, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Gopi Krishna, uh, but I think he's the probably the 20th century at least best communicator and writer on the subject. And uh, he said that genius, all genius, uh, Beethoven, uh, whoever you want to choose as a genius, um, um, William Faulkner, great writers, great artists, are kundalini ready at birth. In other words, some seepage and some distillation of the process I described previously is actually taking place. And this energy is being fed slowly up the spine into the brain. And therefore, they're, the result of uh, is their, their creative genius. Now, one of the one of the things is with this, you, I mean, right now, if you go to Google and type in Kundalini, you're going to get 50 to 100 pages of uh, information. Uh, when I activated Kundalini, or Gopi Krishna did in 1938, and I did in 1972, there was no information. I was lucky to find his book, um, but that's... You know, this, this information, again, is all, there's nothing coherent. It's not uh, something that would be easy to study in a university because all every experience is different. So uh, once you're, once you're, the Kundalini is active in you, uh, it's better to, well, it's probably better not to, to let it start to be truthful, because it's nothing to be played with. But once it does start, it's better to let it do run its course. It is intelligent. Now, it can't balance a checkbook, and it can't give you a uh, writer dissertation on Kant, but it knows DNA because it invented DNA, and it knows the body and the various parts and subsystems of the body, endocrine, skeletal, it knows that. But that, that communication after birth, let's say you're, you, you activate Kundalini when you're 30 or 40 years old, there's a lot of makeup time and makeup work to be done. Um, and so this, this is, it's slow or it's in some people it's very fast and usually when it's fast it's it's uh, painful in some aspect or something is wrong something happens and people are miserable for one reason or another psychically psychologically uh, many times because they can't understand and also biologically or physically uh, so does that is that like is that kind of a starting place? Yeah, I think I think that's a good starting place. One question I have from that is, why do some people just kind of come upon it? Like it just kind of happens to them, and then others kind of have to put in the work to kind of earn it to activate it. Very good question. Uh, like I said, that <laughs> you're if it visits you uh, temporarily or permanently without your 
uh, wishing it to, you're in for a, for a ride, and you better get uh, you better get good information and not from the local airline ma- uh, from the, one of the airline magazines uh, where they've hired a writer to research it and they look at it for maybe even read one book but they've probably read the wrong book. The right book to read, uh, I would say, is Kundalini, The Evolutionary Energy in Man by Gopi Krishna. Next to that is my book, Deciphering the Golden Flower, because what I've tried to do is present Kundalini from the eyes and point of view of a Westerner, just as Gopi Krishna did uh, for the eyes and the outlook of of an Easterner. And uh, there, now there's just so many books on the subject, and um, and I don't know uh, all of them, but a lot of them they, they they have at least basic information about chakras and things like that that's probably useful. But uh, every uh, every experience is different, and when it when it just falls on you from above or wherever, uh, hopefully it's going to work out. And, uh, but you're going to have trouble finding information. It is an evolutionary energy. It is the, uh, Gopi Krishna spoke of something he called the evolutionary impulse. And that is an impulse in mankind to evolve. And I think that's a it's a very believable uh, theory. It's a small theory. I mean, it's like a two word theory, but uh, it's uh, it's the it's what guided uh, studies of evolution. That uh, evolution, if uh, if evolution wasn't there, we'd be back as uh, two celled and one celled animals. And we've evolved. Problem is that so many people today think we've reached the end of, uh, of our evolution, that we can't possibly uh, surpass they, what they see as perfection. Well, if we came from one-celled animals to where we are today, we can posit that we probably will have, in the next 10,000 years, a similar jump in evolution. Um, but you know, if Kundalini uh, wasn't there, there wouldn't be human evolution. And now you can call, you know, that's the, Kundalini is not a good term for Westerners because it has these connotations that make Westerners think of something exotic. And unfortunately, it's the best one that actually describes the, the process. So we're more or less just stuck stuck with it. Uh, life force and other terms are, are good, but life force sounds like something out of a novel uh, or, or a Spielberg movie, um, The Force Be With You. Well, I, I, that probably didn't uh, happen by accident, that coming up with that, that idea of the force, because that impulse is there. And, and it's you know, even people, the worst criminal is subject to that evolutionary impulse. Problem is they're going about it in the wrong way. And there's, I I now have asked myself, uh, is this expansion explosion of Kundalini jumpstarting us as a race, getting that much, evolving that much closer? Is it it uh, jumpstarting the evolutionary process? as opposed to evolution there would still be there taking its course uh, and we'd be evolving, but maybe slower or, fa- or uh, less fast. I don't know, but it seems that the people flocking to it, that impulse is very strong. When I, when I started in 1970, uh, around 1970 with my meditation, I had no idea of these terms. I didn't, I never heard of Kundalini. Uh, I just uh, wanted to, I had this impulse, like this this need to uh, study the, possibly the metaphysical, if I could somehow get from the physical to the metaphysical. 
that would be useful in my life. Uh, little did I know I was in for a, for so far a fifty a fifty year trip. And you had said, you know, sometimes this just comes to people and they're not ready for it or looking for it. And it was that sort of your situation as well. You just started meditating and were doing meditation and it came to you or through this process of meditation, did you have this deeper uh, need to search for, you know, the metaphysical stuff and came, ac came across the Kundalini topic? Well, once I really started, the first thing I did, I'll just backtrack a, an instant here, was I was living in Washington, D.C. Across the street, there was a guy who had a sign in a window up above saying um, hypnoti hypnoti uh, hypnosis, learn hypnosis, something like that. So my girlfriend and I went over there and learned hypnosis. And then, I mean, that got us to kind of alpha states and things like that. But then I was in uh, the, the uh, Chinatown in Washington, and I found this book on yoga. It was a really, really good book. It was written by a guy. I, unfortunately, I lost the book, but it was very basic. And I started reading a little bit beyond the, 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 uh, the poses and saw that there was a whole body of work on meditation. And um, so in my book, I describe uh, how I ended up in Paris and uh, somebody gave me a, a book called The Secret of the Golden Flower, which I put away for a year. I, I kind of glanced at it, browsed it a bit, and then put it away for, for a whole year. And then when I came back to it one day, I just read the whole thing, zap, in one sitting. And I love the poetry. This is the Wilhelm Carl Gustav Jung uh, edition. And I love the, the poetry, but and I knew it was supposed to be a method of meditation, but there was so much Buddhist um, jargon in there that I, I had trouble separating the actual um, learning points of the meditation from the jargon, from the steps of the method. And, and there were actual steps of the method in there, but everything began with breathing. Uh, so breathing is the, uh, the initiator of that sexual sublimation process that I talked about before. So you have to learn to breathe with your diaphragm. And there are many pockets that store air if you breathe correctly behind the kidneys, not just the lungs, but uh, all over the body. So when you learn this diaphragmatic deep breathing, uh, as I did, that was a planned method. That wasn't something that, that uh, uh, you know, just, just was visited on me. The, the only difference was that I had to sort of decipher the method as I went along. And in regards to the, so it starts with the breathing, it goes to the, uh, identification of uh, an e energy buildups and sensations in the body that formerly were not there. I mean, you get, you walk on the street, you go about your work, you go to school. And if you feel a sensation, it's usually you've got a cold or you've got, you know, some kind of or organic issue going, but these were sensations that I'd never felt before and couldn't imagine that were something uh, like some kind of biological de deficiency, that they were, uh, in fact, energy buildups because they took place in the lower belly. And then I perceived that these energy uh, buildups, as this energy had the property of direction. It was going down uh, the back and up the front. And at a certain point, I realized that sounds an awful lot like this may, might connect with the uh, backward flowing method. So I stopped my meditation in this instance, went to the book and read up again for the thousandth time on backward flowing mission with, uh, method, which I had no idea what it really meant. All of a sudden it became clear to me that, that it must mean 
that I can change the, the direction of this energy, which I did. I sat back down and, and ordered it. Uh, I didn't force it. I just ordered it down the front and up the back. And slowly it began uh, climbing my spine or the, the channels that you can read about in any book on chakras um, up the spine, gradually, slowly, and eventually to the brain. And that's when the fireworks started. So my, my uh, practice was totally uh, methodical. I, I, uh, I did discover the, the secrets for myself uh, by using that method. And it's not easy because the method is really so filled with jargon. Uh, and uh, especially um, in, in the most recent versions of the book, they, they really, um, of the translation, most recent translation of The Secret of the Golden Flower, uh, like uh, Clooney, uh, Cleary, they separate the jargon. They admit that that's jargon. It's just uh, Buddhist promotional materials from the, from the third century. Uh, and uh, so I, I have a new book out that just compares the Cleary, the Wilhelm versions with my own experience, because neither Cleary, Cleary Wilhelm, or Jung ever had a Kundalini experience. So I'm testing their, uh, their rendition of the books uh, with uh, my own experience. So I know you said it, it's kind of different for everyone, kind of how they get there. And you said that you start with the, the really deep breathing and then kind of get that backward flow and method going with, with those deep breaths. So does your Kundalini or kind of how you activate it really have nothing to do with like a breath of fire or a fast breath? It's more like really deep breaths kind of going up the front, down the back. Well, when I just started, what, right after that, por the thing I was telling you about the uh, the, the hypnosis guy, I uh, took a trip to California with my the same girl, and we ended up in Laguna Beach. And uh, the the Kundalini yoga had just started that breath of fire, so I I knew what it was. I had practiced it. For a little while, in Kunda, in in this method, uh, I can't speak for other methods, but in my methods, based on the secret of the golden flower, less is more. In other words, the breathe the point of the, the the breathing is to learn to breathe in a very silent room, for instance, so that the breath disappears. The room is breathing you, and you can't hear the, the in flow or the outflow, the inhale or the exhale. You can't hear it because it's so slow, yet you are taking in enormous quantities of air. So all throughout, I would say, and, and this is something that the book stresses and my book stress that, that um silence and and uh, calm uh, produce better results than frantic uh, and and this goes to uh, bodybuilding this applies to bodybuilding and all kinds of uh, hot yoga or any any other um, you, you know Tai Chi is much much more uh, is kind of a a, a, a moving, um, meditation and it's very minimalist so that minimalist effort concentrating on the breathing instead of uh, frantic uh, physical movements is the way to go and so is this something people should be doing on a daily basis is it something where you have to kind of recharge in between sessions or, or 
And, and where do people get started? <laughs> well, the med- like the meditation is where you start, and yeah. it, it all depends now. Um, there, there, I just there's a, a guy named James Nestor. Uh, this is contemporary. Just wrote a book uh, on bre- uh, called Breath, and he's a guy that uh, just an average guy. Evidently, he's a writer. He's a good writer. But he studied, he went out and researched breath and breathing throughout the world with you know, different partners or different uh, people that he interviewed or learned techniques from until he got, um, he filled the pages of a 200-page of a book with information about breathing. And one thing that I learned from the book, and I also learned from my own practice and just talking with other people, Kundalini Kundalini and non-Kundalini people, is that uh, people breathe differently and there are lots of problems with breathing. I have a a post that I've, a couple of posts that I just um, put up on the kundaliniconsortium.org blog uh, uh, where I reviewed that book and talked about some of the the, the problems, you know, like COPD and uh, all different kinds of breathing uh, issues. So he goes into breathing the right way. And I think this b- book is really good for somebody that wants to start because uh, in the first place, people that are breathing through the mouth uh, continually, that's not good. Uh, and the, the method that I used taught me that to, to breathe through the nose. And this book even gets into it in much more depth. And believe it or not, he, won, he in, part, in part of the book, in a section, he, has a, uh, he recounts his experience with a dentist in New York State who started to take these scans of a 15 centimeter square uh, that, that it's, it's, a, it's a, a one dimen- or two dimensional scan, but it shows beyond the, the facial exterior the, what's going on with a person's breathing. And uh, if they're having a breathing problem, in other words, if there's something like where the channels are, are uneven, uh, I wish I, I had a little thing I could read it to you. Uh, it would make more sense. But anyway, um, the book tell, talks about this dentist. And so you, you, you can go anywhere to a dentist that does these, these scans, a spe- specific, type, specific type of scan. And uh, you send the scan to him, and for a fee, of course, he's going to charge a fee. He tells you what issue, the issues you have with your breathing. And he also prepares uh, a denture that you wear that will correct it. And that's why if you go back to the kids wearing, wearing braces, that's a good thing. Braces correct that because that you can change the 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 um, configuration of your breathing apparatus by correcting imperfections in your bite, in your in your jaw, and those type of uh, things. Uh, th- that type of uh, um, denture is a a way to do it. Well, you've seen these things, these ads on TV now, where they have not only the, the implants, but these dentures that, that now you, uh, they form uh, out of hard plastic and you put it on and it corrects your, te- your, your teeth. So you, in other words, I think, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, braces are no longer used. They, you use, the dentists now use these kind of plastic um, devices 
that are sort of, I guess, what this this guy that he details his work because he started way back in the in the seventies. So if you go into Kundalini and breathing uh, and starting with the breath, and you're breathing and you're you're you have a, a an anatomical issue, you're just going to reinforce that anatomical issue and you're going to be doing the wrong thing. And if you do activate Kundalini. Kundalini is going to want to uh, correct that. In other words, it's going to send uh, energy to your jaw and start to pull it apart. Um, something that you could do prior to beginning with Kundalini. So that's some one thing I would say that people should do is, is take the trouble and pay whatever it's necessary to find out if there's anything wrong with their breathing. Because you don't want to go, you don't want to, to practice diaphragmatic deep breathing if you have an imperfection. Uh, is that clear? To... Yeah. Is there is there any kind of without going to get that that you know from kind of doing the work with the breath that someone might be able to tell that they have a problem with their breathing, whether it be you know, waking themselves up in their sleep because of the sleep acne issue or constantly catching themselves, you know, during the day breathing through their mouth or those kind of tales of, hey, you might need to go get that fixed before you endeavor into Kundalini. Well, try to play the trumpet. If you can't, uh, you know, learn, a, learn a wind instrument. Uh, that's one way. If you can't, if that's not possible, if you if you can't get, if you can't get a, uh, if 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 your intonation, you can't get the the correct uh, intervals between notes, then something's wrong. Um, let's see. Um, I would say anything where you're. Um, I talk a lot about um, your, the harmony of your body. I, I have. Uh, I haven't. There's a there's a, a a thing you can do by taking a a picture of yourself. Uh, I've done it. You take a picture of yourself, then you 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 t put it into Photoshop, and then you take you put a you cut down the, the exact center line of your face. And you move those two apart and duplicate the left and the right. So, you, and then you put two rights together and two lefts together, and then your actual face. And you'll see if there's some kind of, uh, of uh, imbalance there. That's not the right, still not the right word, but uh, um, the, I have this in one of my books here. I think I I have a thing where oh yeah see this was done with a butterfly whoop this is in the backward flowing method it's somebody took a butterfly that would had a had one wing longer than the other and they did that and put it together and you could see the uh, so that's a known thing this that. Um, and I studied that, and I've, I'm stupidly I've forgotten the, that word, what the the term is. But I can tell you that part of this thing is that um, in searching for a mate, people are drawn to a harmonically balanced person. <clears throat> horses are drawn to horses that are um, <clears throat> what is that word? Anyway harmonically uh, balanced and uh, <clears throat> and uh, that's a good a, a way of seeing if something is wrong I, I have a whole chapter in that I have, unfortunately I wrote this book like 10 years ago and I don't remember exactly where things are um, but uh, so there there are I, I actually discuss in that book that whole issue of how would you know if you're um, uh, if you're not, 
harmonized. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I can't get it on. <clears throat> anyway, that that's that's there. So, um, uh, it's it's it's. I would advise informing oneself on where you stand <clears throat> in terms of that balance, and uh, there are several ways, including trying to play a saxophone. Uh, and if you can't get the intonation right, then something's wrong with your breathing. And uh, uh, also that, that whole thing of examining the, the, if you're centered, because this is another thing in the meditation in the book and the secret of the golden flower talks about centering. And that's something where when you sit down to meditate and you close your eyes, can you find a center? Or is it wavering back and forth between one side or the other? <clears throat> you should be able to find a center. And once you found the center, that's a powerful indication that you're on the right track in the meditation. It can be uh, while, you, while you're practicing the breathing, it can be, it can take a while or it can be almost immediate. Some people are so harmonically balanced that they sit down or they do anything they do, they pick up an instrument and play it perfectly. Uh, and all they need to do is a little bit more practice and maybe some, some lessons, but uh, um, there are other people are, are not um, harmonically balanced and uh, have you, have you ever heard of things like that? Yeah, that, yeah. That uh, definitely with the, with the breathing, with, with not being balanced. And I I listened to that uh, gentleman you were talking about who wrote that uh, breath book. He was on Joe Rogan, and he was talking oh, talking about yeah. that. So I, I kind of have a little bit of uh, what you're talking about. And as far as like the Golden Flower method, right? And, and you were talking about one of the steps is finding your center. Where, where, um, if, if someone who's listening to this podcast want to kind of start, you know, the backward flowing methods, start the golden flower method, where, where's the starting point? Kind of sit in deep breath, find center, where, where, where kind of, where, where can people kind of go if, if they're looking to start? Well, I have the most up to date. I, in these three books here, um, this one. this one and and this one which is a breakdown of the method the one i talked to you about before they they're they they go together they're like a, a set starting with um this is a a narrative memoir and i think it's important for people to start with that it's a case study in my my case because at least that'll show you some of the things to avoid and what worked for me and what didn't, even though you might have a completely different experience, it's a good way to start uh, to know, uh, to get a feel for. And Gopi Krishna's book is also excellent. This book gets into more of the, the biology and the, of the method and all the things you just alluded to. And then this is a breakdown of, of this, uh, of the whole thing of, uh, the, uh, Secret of the Golden Flower. So to begin with, I would begin with a method. Now, um, I, I recommend those books and Gopi Krishna. He, his is more is a memoir like mine. He, has, he doesn't have a method, but he, he does talk about how he followed a method, uh, how he meditated, and that it all sprung from medic, med, meditation. One of the things you can check is that once the sexual sublimation process begins, it weakens you sexually. Every time you ejaculate, you're going to feel a, a, like an immediate loss of like, uh, and you're going to want to go to, in my case, like, uh, and in his case, he said, like, he felt it uh, like, like, a, like a, a tongue, a fiery tongue searching for, for food in his belly to replenish that energy after ejaculation. 
And for me, it was like, it was like, I don't know, like you would just been picked up by the, by the a feeling as if you'd just been picked up by the SS or something, you know, you're just felt the, uh, and uh, you were going to just fade away. And uh, so you, 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 you know, I, I, in my case, I, I sat down and I went to the refrigerator and eat, ate three little things of yogurt immediately and then conked out and was able to just, so you have to watch that. And a lot of people don't like that idea. And so um, you have to be ready that if that's enforced upon you by the, by a, the fact of an awakening Kundalini, that you, whether it was voluntary or involuntary, um, you you better uh, think about that because if you're if you just want a uh, a, a, a normal sex life and uh, you don't want to make any sacrifices for you know, right now at the, your present age, you better think about doing uh, putting Kundalini off. Uh, uh, again, every every uh, instance is different, so it I, I can't make a blanket statement. I can only repeat what happened to myself and to Gopi Krishna, who I met in 1977 uh, in Kashmir, uh, because I, I still I had so many questions. There was no information, and I wanted to verify a lot of the things with him. Uh, and it turned out that our experiences were quite similar. Um, one of the things after his um, activation was, this is in India, a place renowned for spiritual information. He went around the whole country trying to find information about Kundalini and said, he asked, you know, all kinds of gurus, nobody knew anything about it. He said he got more in information from rick rickshaw drivers than he did from so-called uh, so gurus. And now we have a flood. It's the opposite. But doesn't mean the information is any better. It's, it's just more. And usually more is not better. Um, but so I don't, I stopped reading a lot of that material and going into a more or less creative stage where I'm writing a novel now that I think is a Kundalini, going to be a Kundalini novel in certain, but without ever mentioning the word Kundalini, uh, uh, a, a novel of, of, uh, of uh, accidental awakening, but not, not termed Kundalini. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, there now, um, there's the, uh, what, this, I think I can find this, this method here seems to be like a long version of what I did. Um, I, there's a, in the end of this book here, oh yeah, the microcosmic orbit. Have you guys heard of that? I heard you talk about it in a podcast, but prior to that, oh. no. Oh, Okay. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a very, uh, a lot to, it's a, it's a super sized version of, of my method, I think, although I haven't studied it to that degree, but it seems to be, you got, and also you have to follow it religiously and buy a lot of books and, and, uh, and uh, follow it step by step, but it seems to be the same thing of a, of a backward flowing method it's at this you know somehow the sexual aspect is and it, it, in the west we have no tradition so things are bound to go on wrong go wrong people are bound to do things make stupid decisions and go whole hog for these things that can be pretty harmful and get all mixed up and think spiritual like i'm going to feel some kind of great wave of knowledge or something and uh, where it's a biological process it's slow Gopi Krishna took 20 years before he even thought about writing his first book I took 20 years before I thought about writing why because things were still going on it was still happening and different things different sensations new 
parts of my body opening up. At one point, I developed varicose veins in my, my right leg. And I was used, when I was living in France, the guy I was playing tennis with kept saying, you know, there's this operation for, I, he had varicose veins and he had this operation where they pull out a vein. I don't know how they do it. But anyway, he said, now I don't have it. You ought to do it. And I couldn't tell him that I have this thing going on inside me and maybe it doesn't want me to go in and start yanking out uh, veins and things like that. And then in, uh, 10 years after that, it just disappeared on its own, the varicose veins, as if I had a, a tight sleeve that started from my ankles and just squeezed up the veins to the uh, top of my, uh, uh, to, to my knee. It's, and that's something I can prove because people saw me with the varicose veins and now I don't have them. How did that happen? Kundalini did it. Um, and um, yeah, it's, uh, it's all it means is that we are way beyond uh, what we think we are. There, our potential is limitless. We all saw that movie, Limitless. Well, that's, we're going to get there. Uh, and even beyond that, maybe even to the, to the extent of bodiless beings. Uh, why have a body? It's inefficient. Wars, hate, um, hunger, disease, all because we have bodies. But we have a thing that animates the body that we can almost, you know, that we know is, is our humanity, our special humanity, our individual humanity and i can i can dream that that that's a possibility that uh we could evolve to that uh in which case we'd be a lot better off we wouldn't have pollution we wouldn't have because we'd be self-generating energy uh, beings if you've ever read the um the tibetan book of the dead um yeah, it's it it delves into the state of this um, this being as it it as it um, travels through bodiless um, configurations. And when you had the the varicose veins and they went away through your work with Kundalini, was that something you were focusing on, or it was just something that occurred in occurrence with the Kundalini practice? Well, once uh, I talk about before, during, and after. My before was like, let's see, 32 years. I lived 32 years before Kundalini activated. It took about one year to activate. And then there's been 50 years since then of after Kundalini, living with Kundalini. Once that third period living with Kundalini after Kundalini started, I didn't do it. It did, and it does me. Uh, I talk about the process in, of a graph in one of these books about the whole process of, um, I don't know if I'll find it. Anyway, it's a it's a it's a it's a uh, a chart like a computer, um, uh, you know, chart. Succeed, fail, succeed, fail, and uh, the first part is when you're doing the method, you're doing it, and when you activate Kundalini, it starts doing you. You don't do anything. You don't even meditate. It just does me all 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the last 50 years. And so it took care of the, ver the it first, uh, it first gave me the, the varicose veins and then it made them disappear. Uh, and there are other activities that it's, that it's started and, completed in my body since that. And that is 
because it, like I say, it knows these uh, DNA. It knows uh, all these um, It knows the human body. You don't have to tell it to do. You can't tell it. It knows anything to do with the, with the body. Uh, and it's slowly pushing you from the material to the immaterial, from the physical to the metaphysical. And that's when that energy starts being brought up uh, the spine into the brain on a continual basis as it does with me uh, every single day, it's putting, it's, it's blowing this energy or whatever it is. I, I, at one point, I had this, uh, I don't know if you read this, and in, in, uh, it's in my book, uh, when I was actually undergoing the, the Kundalini activation, uh, which took like a, uh, an overnight process, I was uh, lying down. I was very weak. I'd been fasting for for two weeks and not eating. Well, no, not not. I hadn't eaten in a week. I drank only water, and I hadn't slept for for almost a month because the energy was so was building up for this big breakthrough from finally into the brain. And I lay down. And I was exhausted. I was so weak. And then I felt my solar plexus opening and a force field of energy shooting out in through out of outside of my body and into my third eye. And it third eye opened up like a castanet. It was shaped like that and then closed this energy and then started spraying it around different parts of my brain, which immediately had a corresponding effect on a limb or a region of my body. So the brain, these regions were connected to my body. And it built up my strength because it wasn't, it seemed like there wasn't enough energy coming up the spine. So this, uh, this energy, it's, you know, it seemed to me like, you know, somebody gets, is fighting in, in a war and they get hit and something keeps them going. And I could see that solar, that energy, this, you know, uh, highly evolved energy being that source of, of, of uh, energy, of being able to resuscitate somebody in an extremity. And so we, we not only have uh, uh, these potentials, we have an actual reserve of, of, of energy that's in us. And... I, I, you know, and what what can you conclude from that when you see, actually see this energy shoot out from your solar plexus outside of your body? And you say, for me, I said, there's no such thing as death. I mean, if I'm able to, uh, if the, if I'm an energetic being, the only vulnerable part of me is my body. And you're speaking on the, you know how how your the veins in your legs change because of the kundalini and what your body was going through did you get to a point where you couldn't eat certain foods maybe couldn't take in caffeine could, couldn't kind of you know marijuana anything like that you couldn't yeah. do because you were so sensitive to things absolutely ex uh, excellent excellent uh, analysis because that's exactly what happened i was you know i i for a period of five years, five to somewhere uh, about 10 years. Well, I'd stopped smoking um, when I was about 22, uh, but I still drank until I went to, to France. And strangely enough, in the land of where everybody drinks, I didn't drink all that much because Kundalini was coming on. And once it happened, I just stopped drinking. I never smoked uh, marijuana. Uh, didn't I, I don't drink. Well, mainly because I tried drinking beer. I love love beer and wine, and um, I had this uh, this this pain in my kidney, 
and had to have the doctor come in the middle of the night, which they do in France. On, you know, uh, don't hear. I mean, they wouldn't come in the middle of the night if 50 people were dying. Um, and this, the doctor came and she gave me a shot of a muscle relaxant that stopped that pain. Uh, and it, it was due to the, the alcohol. So I couldn't even drink uh, non-alcoholic beer um, without that. And, and, and also, uh, uh, it, it, it tells you, besides knowing how to um, shift energy around your body, and all the things previously discussed, it also tells you what to avoid, including people. It'll tell you that's not a good person to be, to be with, to visit, to invite to your house. Uh, and so, you know, you, you don't eat uh, whatever it is, um, like uh, maybe a McDonald's. I mean, you know, the, the whole thing with... Uh, meat on with bacon on meat on cheese on bacon on on bread on you know these things these monster thick burgers and um they're not good for you and you don't need to you shouldn't need kundalini to tell you so but um it seems like we need it anyway i'm 83 years old and uh um I, I, words I forget proper names have trouble with, uh, you know, like uh, I, I used to know the the I could recite the lineup of the New York Giants baseball team in 1952 because, uh, but now I don't, I, I'm missing a few players. Uh, I still have Willie Mays in center field, but aside from that, uh, uh, and uh, I love jazz and I, I can't always remember the name of tunes or the name of the of the uh, of the musician so yeah well if i'm anything like you when i'm 83 then i did a good job so uh power to well, you well you know, do the it, things do the things that you just asked the question about <laughs> yeah know that, what that, to avoid that's why i got you on the podcast so i could so i could get the baselines of what i need to do so i can look like you at 83 <laughs> Well, I was playing tennis up to, I had a heart attack in 19, in 2019, but it wasn't too bad. And that was my own fault that I, I, you know, I let uh, cholesterol build up and, uh, but I was out of the hospital the next day and uh, I still get a lot of exercise and I, I think I eat right. And my wife's a fanatic and she won't let me eat <laughs> any, any stuff with too much salt or sugar or fat. So. Yeah, salt is a big thing to, uh, to avoid salt. I mean, it's so such an ingrained thing to just keep pour, pouring on the salt, but it's really bad for, for humans. Um, but, uh, you know, it starts the whole high blood pressure thing and, uh, and which can lead to other more severe, you know, kidney failures, especially. So were you guys both in Denver? You live in Denver? Yeah, yes. we're in Denver. Uh -huh. And and you you do uh, you have a lot of different subjects you attack for your podcast. Yeah, we're we're all over the board. We we go uh -oh. from from Olympians to uh, people such as yourself. We get the psychedelics. We go all over the place. Well, I, I had you know back in the sixties, uh, I led a full sixties uh, life with psychedelics and. Uh, the whole thing and uh yeah it was a my the book i'm writing delves with a, a, is uh on 1968 it's a did breakdown you, of, did you have any psychedelic experience that uh kind of felt like any of your kundalini experiences or was it completely different the first well, uh one time uh I, I was living in Washington, a, a bunch of my friends, we, we went out to, drove out to West Virginia in the middle of the night. And I don't know, this friend of mine uh, knew about a place like on the mountaintop. And so we got up, we, we took the, the mushrooms 
and then hiked up this thing in the dark, this hill. I mean, it was almost a small mountain and waited for the sun to come up. And, you know, I was lying under a tree and it seemed like the leaves when the light came that I could see the molecules and the leaves and, uh, and everything was very clear. Um, I think that's, that's sort of like a junior Kundalini um, experience, like all of a sudden a clairvoyance and a, a, a molecular uh, show of, uh, but people have to also realize that, that that's not why you get into these things for psychedelics or for secret powers or for extraordinary hidden powers, that type of thing. If you're, if you're thinking, Hey man, I'm going to get really, you know, I'm going to be able to, to see uh, the mystery, uh, understand the mystery of life. And I'm going to be able to transport myself from here to Chicago. Uh, and uh, that's not the, that's not, that shouldn't be the goal. Uh, because it's, it's kind of a, a selfish goal is to have some kind of extraordinary power. Um, just be a normal person. If you do it, if you want to write a book, write a, write a book, like, you know, follow. That's what I tell people who, who, write, who do contact me and having an awful time with Kundalini. And I say, write it all down because you, this will force you to concentrate on the moment because what you're going to write is going to be shit the first time because you don't know how to write and writing is a skill. So it takes time to do it. Keep writing, go over it, find out that, Hey, I don't understand what I wrote. Nobody else will fix that. And you know, that'll, that'll force you to think of, uh, to concentrate on the moment as opposed to, imaginary or things that you think are happening to you, or even if they are happening, then explain them, put them down on, on paper. So anyway, that's a, again, curious, like, is this maybe not an everyday practice, but I mean, are you experiencing like right now, as you're sitting here talking with this, is it something that you're yeah, I mean, in frequency. my brain, I feel a pulsing in my brain is like pressing towards because the Kundalini builds up in me. So by five in the afternoon now, let's see what time it is. It's four, okay. It's almost three here. So by five, that's the peak. And that's when I lie down and let the Kundalini just go through, run through me for about a half hour to 45 minutes it seems to build up. When I first started, I had to do that twice a day around noontime and then again in, in the evening. Um, but it's always active in now, but it's just, it's, it's always pushing something. Um, it's always going somewhere, uh, but the, it's breath and brain. Breath always breathing through your, through your nose for inhale and exhale, and always the brain, something's happening in the brain because of that energy being uh, pushed up uh, the spine into it, into the brain and feeling the, the consequences that, as that it gets sprayed around different parts of the brain. Oh, you know, you've probably read that, that, that a part of, uh, there's a, that a node in the brain controls a limb, a toe or something like that. And uh, I mean, I don't know any of the anatomy. I purposely don't get too involved in technology because it tends to be um, a refuge for, for, the, for, the, for people who don't know what they're talking about. And they get they get stuck in their technology, and they want you to accept their technology. So I say no technology. Just explain it in ordinary language, in everyday language, and you that'll be a lot. You'll be a lot better off. 
Yeah, that's the truth. So I think that's the thing too, is that the technology around us has stifled us from tapping into the technology with inside us, you know? Kundalini, that's Kundalini is into the technology inside you. And you can come up with your own terms uh, because we lack terms, but we don't have that tradition here in the West. And uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's going to be hard to develop because we're so bound up in, in uh, especially now with these, you know, with not listening to each other and uh, these, these, this alienation and um, everyone is alienated because they are right and everybody else is wrong. And uh, uh, we, we don't, you know, um, the founding fathers use the word vir virtue. Do you know how they use it? They used it, Washington, Jefferson, and Madison. The Jefferson and Madison, who wrote the uh, Constitution and the, and the did, virtue meant, in those days, it didn't meant like a, a woman's virtue, like being uh, not, I don't know what, it, you know, sleeping around with, with, with men. Virtue meant self-sacrifice. And uh, uh, it meant altruism. And George Washington said, uh, if, we, if we can't, if we don't have that virtue, that level of virtue, we will lose this war. Because everybody must sacrifice beyond. Uh, and as soon as the war was won, we went back to those practices of everybody for themselves. Uh, um, buy my product, that type of thing. And um, so we've gotten away from that, that, the, that meaning of virtue, where it's this selflessness, this altruism. And, uh, you know, another thing is, another thing is throughout some of my blog posts, I, I talk about um, self-remembering in Kundalini, like the Gurdjieff, have, do you, are you familiar with Gurdjieff or Ospensky? Oh, well, Gurdjieff was this, I don't even know what he was. He was a very mysterious guy. He was maybe a Russian, maybe a, a Turk or something. But in the 20s, he's one of these people from the 20s. He came up with this, this method of, uh, and it was, I don't, I don't know what the, the basis of the, me the method was self-remembering, uh, which meant that uh, uh, he, he doesn't explain it very well in his books. He's written a lot of books, but this, he had a kind of disciple co-host uh, named uh, Ospensky. And Ospensky is very clear, very, very good writer. And he wrote this book, The Fourth Way, on the whole technique of self-remembering, which is to, at any given time, to come back to yourself, to say, I am me. Uh, Mike, I'm standing here in the bank, in the line. I'm not getting upset because the line's moving slowly. I'm not going to leave my body and jump to the head of the line and start agonizing. Uh, I'm going to, so this constant remembering yourself. And people ask, ask me a lot of times uh, about Kundalini and, uh, and self-remembering. And I say they're not mutually exclusive. You, it's very beneficial to remember yourself because self-control is the secret to life on earth. Um, that's why Obama was a good guy. I'm not saying he was a great president, but he was a good guy because he was totally self-controlled. He took any amount of punishment and, uh, and always in control. And uh, if people were more controlled, uh, it would be because they were able to remember themselves. And so if you get in an accident or something like that, you don't immediately try to choke the other person. Or if you're fighting over a parking space, um, 
you move on to the next one. And uh, competition is, is something we've had to, it's in our genes, obviously through to survive, there, there had to be competition. But now as we evolve, um, the, these are things that uh, Kundalini has me thinking about in spite of myself. First thing that think came to me was when the, the night I, the morning I woke with the Kundalini in full bloom was all violence is self-hate. And uh, so the biggest self-hater in the ever was Hitler because he was a failure as an artist. And uh, so he was too cowardly to kill himself. So he took it out on other people. And uh, so you, I don't know, maybe, maybe these things are a little, these, these thoughts or impressions, whatever they, that come to you are a little bit uh, strange or, or less coherent, but I, I, I get these things. Um, and are they insights or delusional? I don't know. <laughs> it's, Maybe a little of both. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's that balance, the yin and the yang. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And and women are, are great. Um uh I think that I would not even be alive if it weren't weren't for women because they're i I've I've only uh, all the great lessons I've learned in life are uh, came from women. Um, and one one last thing that just kind of came to my head as we were talking, would you say that semen retention is probably the baseline to kind of start in a, a Kundalini journey? Like you're not going to be able to be having a lot of sex or masturbating a lot and activate your Kundalini. You kind of need that life force to, to get you activated. Yeah. Did you, did you know I wrote a book on that? Yeah, I listened to it. I listen oh, okay. to the audiobook. Yeah, the point of that book is that uh, that you 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 can um, what, what do you want to, you can climax without ejaculating. You can learn to do that. So you can have sex, but you don't have to ejaculate. But you have to learn how to do it. So, uh, but ejaculating for me and for Gopi Krishna. And other people that have had similar experience to us, whereas I'm not talking about other people who've had Kundalini things and don't don't even know what we're talking about. You, the answer is yes, that uh, you um, uh, ejaculation is harmful. It's not beneficial. It's harmful because you have to replenish it. And uh, but then again, storing semen I think clogs. If you go for a whole year without ejaculating i think the semen gets tired and may, you may have to uh, renew it or something i i've I run across these things it seems more powerful once it builds back up in other words if you ejaculate on day one and day two and three you feel weak and all of a sudden you start to build back your strength on day four and it goes increasingly that the kundalini gets increasingly strengthened in the following days, that may be because you've renewed the, while you're, you know, I don't know how you, how old you, you, you can, how, what age you can do this to, but uh, um, I've been able to do it 80, in my 80s, so it's possible. Um, but I, I rarely ejaculate. And Kundalini will tell you right away. No. And uh, so then you have to get to, you have to get creative if you want contact with a, with a, another you know, sexual contact. Awesome, JJ. Thank you for your knowledge. We have some rapid fire questions, just some four questions that we asked all our guests. Uh, sure. First one. I know you said you don't you don't do caffeine. We usually ask our guests if they drink coffee. Uh, do you do tea or anything, or no caffeine at all? 
I, I, I love the taste of good coffee, but I, I haven't, I've never drunk coffee very much because I, I felt some, even when I was a, you know, the, at that age when everybody else was drinking coffee and going nuts if they didn't have coffee, I didn't go nuts, but I do drink tea. Um, I drink uh, Earl Grey because it has bergamot, which is uh, good for cholesterol in it. And just green tea, usually, you know, sometimes, but I'm not, a, I, I don't drink 50 cups or I drink maybe, and not every day. Other than your meditation and Kundalini, do you have any daily practices or rituals that you do on a regular basis to level up or show up as the strongest version of JJ every day? Well, you know, this virus has had an impact on what people can do. And uh, well, I live in a very remote area in Northern California, about five hours from any, from Sacramento or San Francisco or Portland, even further. Uh, so there's not a lot to do here anyway. But yes, there is. I mean, there's na nature. I mean, there's all course signs of kayaking and climbing. And, um, you know, we've got incredible we're right on the ocean, more or less, and, and on Humboldt Bay. Uh, so, but I, I, I read, I write, uh, I write, I try to get like four hours of writing early in the morning. And then I have to take care of business, you know, like uh, whatever, you know, household business. And, I, and, and then I read and maybe I'll watch a movie uh, or a sporting event on TV. Um, but I don't, there's nothing like I, I go out and go to a yoga practice um, or anything like that. I know you said you read. So what are you reading right now? What are you listening to music or podcasts or anything like that? Well, I, I, I'm reading a book by a guy named Cannon, K-A-N-O-N. -N. Uh, it's called something like Istanbul um, something. It's a, it's a book about CIA, 1945, uh, the, the fact that Istanbul, but Turkey was neutral and all the spies from all the countries congregated there and uh, it's a fiction. It's a it's a kind of a spy thing. But the guy is a very good writer, and I just finished a book by um, that everybody ought to read. This is an incredible book. Well, a breath book I read, but this one here is I can this I can find on my little thing here. Where's the books? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, Istanbul Passage, Istanbul. And then Confessions of a, of a New Economic Hitman. I read, I read that. I read, I read everything that Theodore Dreiser ever wrote. He's a great, the, the greatest American writer ever. He's an amazing writer. And then what's that? Oh, yeah, The Street. That's this. Have you ever heard of this book called The Street? No. It's written by Ann Petrie. It was written in, I think, around 1940. It's about a black woman in, uh, with, a, with a child in Harlem. And it has, it is a, a great book. And it has a chapter that's probably one of the funniest um, chapter on uh, white teacher uh, in Harlem teaching to all black uh, students kids in third grade, I think, or fourth grade or something like that. And, but it's very well written. And uh, yeah, so I do a lot of eclectic reading and uh, writing. I'm writing this novel on uh, 1968. It's about a producer, a television producer against the background of the, 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 the earth shattering events of 1968, the assassinations, the, the May upheaval in France and uh, uh, the, the Nixon campaign 
uh, tossing in a lot of, of various women involved in the, in the story. So you mentioning your, your eclectic reading collection uh, and, and before uh, March of 2020, this used to have a lot, much more lighthearted uh, tone to it. But our last question for the day is, uh, do you ever uh, get down with conspiracy theories? Have you had any alien uh, encounters? You live in the Pacific Northwest in Northern California. Have you ever seen a Sasquatch? <laughs> I am probably the least conspiracy theory person living today. I uh, I see it as a as an escape. You know, I may be wrong, but uh, I've I've I, if you take any of these things and break it down, sometimes there's just no answer. I mean, the two the two two or three people involved are dead, and you can't get any more out of it and uh the uh there's there's just i mean you, the, the rest is all imagination and you you, you ought to turn it into a novel um I, I don't know can you think of a conspiracy now that just to test my what i'm saying that that i might be wrong about do you think we went to the moon yeah now i have a son who's like 28 years old and he's he he plays professional basketball in in Europe, so he's he's played in all these different countries, and uh, he is a hot conspiracy. I mean, he's into all these conspiracy. Nine Eleven didn't happen, and all these things. And we don't talk very much about those things because <laughs> there's not much common ground. There's uh, I, I just ask him to produce some a bit of evidence and. And he's also, you know, he, he's, what about, you know, the, the vaccine? There's another one. He's not going to be vaccinated. And, uh, and yet he lives here. Well, when, he, when, he's, when he's not playing, he, he lives here. And, you know, probably out there exposing us to, uh, us old folks to who knows what. But anyway, I've had my shots. In the, did, did you guys get vaccinated? No. You're against it? You are? I wouldn't say I'm against it. I just want to wait for the first uh, clinical trial results to come back, and then maybe I'll, I'll sign up and, and volunteer for it. Yeah, no, I think that's good, for especially for, for guys you, your age. Yeah. For me, it's like, uh, you know, I, I've taken risks all my life at, uh, in certain things. So I'm going to – by the way, I, I had the two, two shots of Moderna, I didn't feel a thing for either one. Maybe they just gave me water or something, a placebo for because I was gonna say maybe it's the young, Kundalini. <laughs> young guys, I mean, uh, uh, this uh, my uh, young cousin, who's a, another twenty-eight year older. Um, he's my first cousin's grandson. We're really, we're, we're big buddies. Uh, he had a three days after that this this first shot and he was like completely incapacitated and yeah that surprised me that i i didn't I was, something must be happening you know maybe it's kundalini <laughs> hopefully well, not to get too into the weeds but you mentioned your son is a professional basketball player over in europe does he use kundalini in his basketball or is it no no, no he doesn't no. He, he he doesn't I mean, we don't, I, I taught him yoga when I, when he was real young, he was very responsive up until about 13. And then he went in, into his own thing. And, and, uh, you know, I can't say he, he's smart in many ways and, uh, and examines things in depth, but, uh, you know, it's normal to have a, a, a gap in uh, between generations and this, uh, what's happening now highlights that. It's very easy to say that, but look at, I was in the Marine Corps. We walked through a line and got jabbed in each arm, boom, 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 boom. You know, it was like, you know, people were passing out. You know, you walk through this line with a guy on the left and a guy on the right jabbing you, you get like 10 shots in, in, in less than five minutes. Um, 
and uh, I didn't even know what they're for, but uh, you know, you're you're, uh, the, you're in the government uh, employee at that point, and you okay. don't have much to say <laughs> about anything. You're just a low, you're just a, sh- a low shitbird. That's <laughs> how they refer to you. So is the Kundalini? Did that come after the Marines, or was it? Was oh yeah. A, yeah, yeah. That would not have. I would have. I would have been a madman. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, it's very hard. It's easy to get in, very hard to get out. Yeah. Although we did have one guy who who uh, who got out, and uh, but he played crazy. He went. He he wasn't crazy, but he pretended to be crazy, and he got out. So that's <laughs> he just couldn't stand it anymore. Yeah, it's like that was. I got out when I was twenty one, and I didn't start the meditation for another about another nine years okay cool which were the the 60s and that was in the in washington dc in a uh, a, one of my favorite cities on earth do you think it should become a state well i i think that depriving the people of uh of uh you know an active uh um, re- represent, they have a representative, but I don't think she, she's, it was a woman, she's been there forever. I don't think she has any power. She has like kind of a, can, uh, she can, she can disagree or agree, but they don't counter vote uh, as far as I know. And she's a, in Congress, but then maybe they should have a Senator or something. I don't know. Uh, but the, the votes are counted. I mean, for president, for, uh, uh, but the, back when I lived there, they had the, the House um, District Committee controlled it, and they were, it was run by Southerners. So here you have this black city ro- controlled by, by Southerners who were outright racist. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a tough time for, it's changed a lot since then. Yeah. I, uh, Used to know uh, what's his name, the the mayor who had all the the drug problems. Uh, mayor Barry. Yeah, Barry. I knew him very well. As a matter of fact, he used to he he lived right around where where I lived, and my girlfriend and I, uh, the one that went to uh, to uh, California and France with me, uh, we took a a neighbor's kid to to. Uh, for the summer to Martha to um, Nantucket Island, <laughs> and uh, uh, and so Barry used to he he liked that fact that we we did the, took this little black boy to the to uh, this this bastion of like white um, <laughs> wealth. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's like it's the, probably the most wealthy. You can't even get on there. And all the carpenters and people that used to live there have been forced off the island because they can't pay the taxes. And... Thank you so much. Thank you for the work that You're you welcome. put out and having this conversation with us and just giving us all the information you got. Thank you so much. Well, yes. you guys, whatever else you are, you're real. So <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And I, I love it when, when, when a guy's your age are at least somewhat interested in, in older, you know, what, what's been accomplished. And that goes for my, I was telling you, I have this long, younger cousin, you know, he read my, my, I gave my book to my, my, my cousin. He's older than me. He's 10 years older than me. He's dead now. Uh, and he, he didn't even read it. He gave it to his son who didn't read it, who gave it to his son who read it and called me and said, I'm your cousin. I just read your book. I'm 28 years old. I'm a painter. I loved it, you know, so we, we got really tight. Um, and and uh, a lot of people have no, it, it, there's no possibility of contact with, with the younger generation. And it's too bad. How yeah. old are you guys, by the way? I'm, I'm 45 and Jimmy's 34. There's 11 wow. years between us. Okay. But yeah, I think it's this is valuable information. And, and I think there's a lot of, you know, kind of ancient old world uh, 
technologies and stuff that we just have forgotten or haven't been taught. And, and like you said, we are very special beings and, and very powerful. Um, and, and anything that we can do that we can get that information out to more people, you know, we're just trying to contact with people like yourself that are, have done research and written and, and produce stuff into topics that we're interested in. And it gives us an opportunity to connect and have a great conversation. So thank you very much for your time. And we really appreciate your work and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch if, if Kundalini contacts us. We're going to keep practicing. Great. <laughs> great. Thank you very much. I appreciate your interest.